Welcome to the story of the Mandali. Welcome to the story of the Yagya. Welcome to your story. The Brahma Kumaris was founded by the son of a schoolmaster in Hyderabad, Sindh. He was born Lekraj Kupchand Kripalani on the 15th of December, 1884. Lekraj was a jeweller and referred to as Baha'i Lekraj. Bhai Lekraj was a devotional man and he would spend the mornings reading the Gita and discussing spiritual ideas with his friends. But as his interest increased further, his guru advised him to start reading the Gita to others to help his understanding. Spiritual gatherings were popular at that time and so people in Lekraj's community began to gather at his home to listen to him read the Gita. The gathering was an intimate one, with most members related to each other through birth or through marriage. With husbands and fathers away for long periods on business, satsangs gave women and children the chance to come together in a positive and fruitful way. In 1932, Bailek Raj started becoming more serious about his spiritual study. He spoke to his mind every day, trying to understand it and scribbling his thoughts and feelings in his diary. The readings of the Gita at his home helped to deepen his understanding. So he kept reading and others kept listening. In January 1934, Lekraj's uncle died. This was a decisive moment for him, and he began to turn his mind even more deeply to spiritual matters. Bai Lekraj became Satyana, meaning 60-ish. At the age of 54, Lekraj entered Vanprast, the age of retirement. A short time later, Bai Lekraj arranged a large reception at his home in Hyderabad for his guru. And while his guru was speaking, Lekraj got up and walked out. Now, it was unlike Lekraj to do something so socially awkward, so his daughter-in-law, Brajindra, followed him. And as she watched... Prajindra reported seeing light around Lekraj, and she felt bodiless. She reported hearing the following words emerge in a whisper from Lekraj's mouth. It was not uncommon for spiritual leaders to say, Shivo hum, Shivo hum. But it would be many years before Lekraj or Brajindra would understand the significance of what happened. This experience was life changing for Lekraj, and in 1935 he travelled to Varanasi. Bai Lekraj was aching to understand what was happening within him and he almost compulsively drew circles on the walls of his friend's home, time and again, time and again. When Lekraj returned, he and those who gathered with him started the practice of chanting Om. Those inside started having visions and going into trance. Those outside started calling the gathering Om Mandali. 
It was these experiences, visions and deep reflections that brought the community to their first point of understanding about the soul. They clearly understood that each one was a spiritual being, separate from the body. The soul was Aham Brahm Asmi, or a form of God. The soul was infinite, divine light. In 1936, Lekraj had three visions. One of a devastating world destruction. One of a blissful paradise. and one of the four-armed god Vishnu, accompanied by the words, You are this. Others also continued to have visions of divine beings, of Krishna, Vishnu and light. The love and belonging of that time was unique and to this day remains unmatched. By then, Lekaraj was being addressed Baba, Om Baba, Bhagavan and Mandali Mata. They knew the soul was Aham Brahmasmi and infinite light. Now they understood that time went in a 5,000 year endlessly repeating cycle of four ages. They believed that the soul and God travelled through the four castes. Brahman in the Golden Age, Kshetriya in the Silver Age, Vaisha in the Copper Age, and Shudra in the Iron Age. They also thought that the Golden Age would be played out in the celestial world, that the deities would have this knowledge during the Golden and Silver Ages, and it would then gradually die out over 5,000 years, to then be reborn, next cycle, through Prajapati God Brahma. They felt the destruction of the old world was imminent. There would not be another Diwali. In 1937, Om Baba travelled with his family to Kashmir for a few months. He left on Mandali in the hands of the main sister, Mama, and sisters Kumarka and Manmohini, who would read Baba's letters to the class. Om Baba spent time in solitude, seeking further clarity. But even in his absence, the community in Hyderabad continued to experience trance and visions. When Om Baba returned, he told others, with conviction, that there was another power working within him, and that this was more than a mandali, but a divine yagya. Others continued to see Om Baba in the form of Krishna and Vishnu. So for them, his claims only confirmed their belief that he was indeed God incarnate. In October of that same year, Om Baba established a trust, handing over his significant wealth and property to a small group of young sisters. Om Baba had profound faith in the ability of young women to be true spiritual leaders. He remained an advisor. And while Mandali gained strength in numbers as well as conviction, some of the men began returning home from their journeys. Within a short time, they found out about Om Mandali and the focus on purity. There was an outcry from the entire community women were becoming forthright and independent and children were leaving their families. The independence of women and the practice of purity was a threat to traditional life. For the head of at least one family, the mere existence of Om Mandali was a grave danger to society. 
Picketing and protesting from families and the broader community began. And threats of legal battles ensued. But despite their lack of intellectual understanding, members had great confidence that they were the same souls of the previous cycle, that they were the chosen ones, that they could transform the world of sorrow to bring the world of happiness. There was absolutely no doubt, no thought, and no desire to be or to do anything else. The protests turned increasingly violent, and so the community moved to Karachi. But despite the move, the conflict followed them, as did a series of court cases brought by the families to try to disband on Mandali. That same year, Mama was cross-examined by a magistrate. She gave evidence. I am God, all are God, and Om Mandali itself is God. Mama explained, there is no difference between male and female, because all are God. There is no difference between a dedicated one and a householder, because, with knowledge, both are as pure as the lotus flower. Feelings of being bodiless increased. They felt they were merging with the Brahm element, the element of light. Even the first pictures of the cycle and the tree have infinite divine light written around them. After extended legal battles, the case against Om Mandali was finally thrown out. Around this time, the community stopped reading the Gita and started to note down the distinctive knowledge that Om Baba was now sharing. They called these notes Vanis. Around 1942, the role of Brahma was clarified for the very first time. A young sister, Pushpa, went into trance and then a whispering voice spoke through her. Om Baba referred to this personality as Piyu, meaning the beloved. Om Baba was curious about this personality and its power, and he began calling the spoken versions Piyu Vanis, meaning versions of the beloved. Piyu gave Om Baba the name Brahma, and, speaking through another sister in trance, clarified the role of Brahma as creator. However, many others weren't convinced. During this time of great intoxication and love, everyone gave even more titles to Brahma. Brahma, though, still wondered, who was this Piyu? Brahma Baba relied on a series of trance messengers for further understanding. Knowledge was still based on Aham Brahmasmi, I am light, a form of God, or Aham Chaturbhuj, I am Vishnu, a form of God. After ten years of being together, Gulzar, a hesitant and shy young girl, had the first experience of Brahma in the subtle regions. This was a critical point in the development of their understanding. Mama and Baba would ask Gulzar to pose questions to this being who was like cotton wool. Sometimes the figure would remain silent. Other times there were brief but mysterious answers. Over a period of time, though, this angelic being was a great source of inspiration to the Yajna. In 1943, during a collective month of silence, an important point was clarified. Piyu entered a sister in trance and said, The figure up there is the perfect and complete Brahma, and the one down here is the effort-making form. The one down here will become like the one up there. From 1943 through the early 1950s, Avyakt Brahma was a source of tremendous inspiration.
During these years, while World War II was going on, the Yagya reasoned that this was the very same Mahabharata war spoken of in the scriptures, and the old world would be destroyed in 1950. Still inspired by the Gita, they felt they were living the famous story of the Pandavas' 13-year exile. They felt there would be 13 years between the official beginning of the Yagya and the total demise of the old world. On the 14th of August, 1947, was the partition of India and Pakistan. And it was a time of untold chaos and violence. The Yagya maintained silence for protection and also to develop their spiritual strength. The high wall that Baba had built earlier to protect them from community rebellion served them well during the social and political violence of partition. Around this time, a young dedicated brother, Anand Kishore, started to feel that there was indeed a divine, beautiful and unique personality working through Brahma. But this clarity and perception was not common. Some saw a special sparkle and light on Brahma's face and forehead from time to time. But for most, Baba was Baba. In 1949, Brahma is still in the pictures as Prajapati God Brahma. Baba, however, was becoming convinced that there was a completely distinct and divine personality at work, somehow. In May 1950, the Yagya left Pakistan. By steamer, they travelled from Karachi to the port of Oka, India. As the knowledge had recently started to become clearer, Baba directed all literature documenting their early understandings to be destroyed. Many were reluctant to leave their precious diaries, so Baba told them a story, that if they buried their books, they would be discovered as sacred texts on the path of devotion next cycle. It was the only way they would leave the written record of their extraordinary lives behind. Once they arrived at Oka, they boarded the train, and off they went to begin their new lives in Rajasthan. The Yagya arrived at the hill station of Mount Abu. After a brief time at Brijkoti, they moved to Pokhran House, the current site of Pandavbhavan. Named after the garden where Krishna played, they called the ashram Madhuban. But while everyone came, not everyone stayed. They faced a time of scarcity and poverty. From a comfortable life in a warm environment by the sea, they were living with little food, poor nourishment, and cold weather at high altitudes. Many children got sick, and many others returned home to their families. In the early 1950s, Shiv Baba was thought of as the oval form. In the posters, infinite divine light and God Brahma were replaced by the presence of incorporeal God Shiva. A lot more was clarified, like the understanding of mind, intellect and sanskaras. The differences between Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Shankar and Krishna all became clear. Service began in centres outside of Madhuban, and Brahma Baba became known as Prajapita, father of the people, in contrast to Prajapati, lord of the world. Understanding and further clarification continued through trance in Madhuban, as well as other centres all through India. 
By then, everyone understood that Shiv Baba and Brahma Baba were two distinct entities. Reportedly, though, many still felt that Beloved Baba was Beloved Baba, whether there were two or one. The relationship between Shiv Baba and Brahma Baba, or Bab and Dada, was further clarified in the late 1950s. Shiv Baba is God, the mother and father. Brahma Baba is the elder brother, the first prince of the Golden Age and the father of the people. God was not omnipresent. The Supreme Soul was a conscious, distinct point. The knowledge of the soul as a point of light also became clear, and the oval form of God was given a little white point in the centre. Two entities were clearly at work, and Shiv Baba was supreme. With this important revelation, Brahma Baba once again directed all records of previous knowledge to be destroyed for the second time so that there would be no trace of wrong understanding remaining. On the 24th of June, 1965, beloved Mama, the main sister, left her body. Unknown to them, in just a few years, senior sisters Manmohini and Kamarka would soon guide the Yajna. Because on the 18th of January, 1969, beloved Brahma Baba left his corporeal body and joined with the Supreme Soul. These two together are known as Aviyakt Bhaktada. It is these combined souls who meet the gathering today in Madhuban. And as it was said in an early Aviyakt Vani of 1970, Bhaktada are one, even though they are two. कभी कभी मुझे वो घड़ी याद आती है मेरी जिंदगी में कोई आया उसने मुझे अपना बनाया उसने मेरे दिल को 
गुनगुनाना सिखाया मेरे मन को उड़ाना सिखाया जब अंधेरी रात ने मुझको घेरा उसने आकर मुझको बुलाया आओ बच्ची आओ आओ वापस अपने घर आओ वापस अपने घर मैंने जिद भी की मैंने मुख भी मोड़ा लेकिन फिर भी छोड़ा नहीं मुझको बार बार बुलाया बार बार बुलाया उसने
I'm not the only one. 